I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to talk a little bit to Stuart Kanan, who is a legend in these parts and in the world of violin playing. And uh, we share a passion for New Century Chamber Orchestra. Of course, he was the first music director. Mr. Kanan, it's wonderful to have the chance to meet you in person. Well, I'm glad that you don't have a mask on because now I know who you are. You're Daniel Hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were very kind to allow me to take it off, <laughs> of okay. to be at a safe distance. The, the but um, worth taking. Okay. Go before ahead. we talk a little bit about New Century, yeah. um, I was wondering if you could tell us and tell me the story again about the Potsdam Conference because this is really, truly one of the most amazing stories as far as music and yeah. and the world is concerned. <laughs> Well, it happened in 1945. I was a GI, I was a rifleman, and I was being moved up to the front with the rest of the troops. We were what we called the replacement depot. In other words, I was to take the place of anyone who didn't quite make it. So we ended up, the war ended on May 8th, and I was in Kassel, Germany very lovely old town and the war ended and two days later I had my commanding officers had given me orders to go back to Paris which to my young way of thinking was not too difficult to change <laughs> so we drove back to Paris and I was moved into a special service company the, the company was formed to provide entertainment for the GIs at that time who were going to remain in Europe, and among the people there was in that group was Mickey Rooney, the actor, and Joshua Logan, the famous Broadway conductor, Federico Rey, a very famous Spanish dancer of those days. Anyway, just a whole bunch of musicians, uh, designers, uh, uh, and we got together, and then finally Eugene List, the pianist, came across. And he was a wonderful pianist, had already had quite a career in the States. And we got together as two classical musicians were doing. We started to play together. And our commanding officer said, it would be nice if you both went out as help to help entertain the GIs who were not able to move or anything. They were in hospitals, you know, with horrible wounds and all that. So we did, we went out and just did dozens and dozens around the Paris area. And time moved on, this was in May of 1945. Time moved on, it became July, and one day, beginning of July, our commanding officer said, you know, President Truman, and he had become president in April because of Roosevelt's death, he said, President Truman has asked for some GI entertainment, and I think, you two guys would be just perfect for that because he loves music. So they flew us to Berlin with Mickey Rooney <laughs> in a big uh, C-54, I guess it was, just the three of us sitting facing each other on those benches al along the side of the plane. We flew into Tempelhof and I saw Berlin then well, like I've never seen it or before. Completely it was, destroyed, it completely was bombed destroyed, out. Completely destroyed. Anyway, we landed safely and we, they uh, bust us over to Potsdam, which was about 30 minutes away from Berlin, I guess. And there was a nice tent set up and there went my dreams of having a good bed or something because Truman's house that he was living in was just across the street from our tent. But anyway, our commanding officer said, there's your tent, guys, and Mickey Rooney, and there were three bunks in it, and we all occupied separate bunks. And that, that night spent in the, in the uh, tent was memorable because Mickey unrolled his entire repertoire of jokes, funny dialects, shtick, and all the rest of it. <laughs> we were hysterical. But the next day came, and our commanding officer said, you gentlemen are coming, you and Eugene, he said, I heard that there may be a, a, some foreign dignitary there, and I'm not sure that Mickey's humor would, would go over. So we went across the street and to the backyard of the house, and, and there was the staff, American staff and, and soldiers and whatnot. 
And then finally, uh, uh, we went upstairs to the uh, back porch, and we could see through the French doors that dinner was being served. And suddenly, we were on the porch and looking out over the street. We heard the automobiles coming down the street. We looked out, there's one, two big black limousines. And we stared there to see who got out of that. The first one was Harry Truman. The second one was Winston Churchill. And the third one was Marshal Joseph Stalin. Oh my goodness. So we, <laughs> we were, you know, God alive. We said, what are we doing here? And you had no idea. No that idea. They were come. No, no idea that we were going to be playing for these three in any way. But you see, we had a program that we had played for the wounded GIs. Uh, it consisted of Tambourin Chinois. By and, Chrysler. Uh, by Chrysler, yeah. of course. And, uh, and uh, La Vida Breve, of Mind of the Fire. You know, just pieces like that which would amuse our, our GI, the wounded GIs. Anyway, after dinner, the doors, the French doors opened and the three gentlemen came out and were standing there. <laughs> looking, you can imagine. So, and there was a sofa for three, seated, uh, set up on the porch. And Truman sat in the middle. He was the host. Winston Churchill uh, sat on his right, befitting his political leanings. And Joseph Stalin sat on the other side, the left, fitting his a little. I don't know whether that was chosen with malice or what. But and that's a famous photograph. I mean, everyone knows yes, that photo. Course. Yes, of course. So anyway, uh, and then Truman said, gentlemen, play something for us. Now, I had put my violin under an old, cranky, uh, upright piano just to get it out of the way. Uh, and I, bent, I went behind the piano to get my fiddle. And a Russian GI who was uh, Stalin's aide, he leaped across the room, I'm telling you, it must have been 50 feet <laughs> in two bounds. He was at my side watching to see what I was taking. Because <laughs> he thought you might, you he, might well, yes, like, of you know, course. He, he was waiting to see what I took. <laughs> <laughs> when I took out a bow and then the fiddle, he went back to his place and said, that's, that's okay. So, and then Truman said, gentlemen, play something. So we got out our, our uh, music and uh, we played for about 30, 40 minutes. And, and as you were playing, yes. I mean, were you, were you, you were aware, of course, of well, these I was, gentlemen there? Before, before I played, I was so nervous, you, you wouldn't believe it. And I had been a, you know, I was 19. I had been playing some concerts at, at an earlier age. But I was so nervous getting out there. But the minute I put my fiddle in my hand, I somehow retained a sense of normalcy because this is what I do. <laughs> yeah. And we played. And, uh, and uh, after we finished, uh, there was, you know, uh, oh, yes, Eugene List, just uh, out of a whim, he decided to play the theme from the Tchaikovsky piano concerto. Da, 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 da. You, know, you know the rest. Yeah. <laughs> and Stalin jumped up from his chair and as a toast to the musicians. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Amazing. So that's what happened. And then the evening ended and Truman liked our music so much. First of all, later on, he said it made a nice start to what would have been hell for him. This novice politician on the world stage facing Truman, uh, facing uh, Churchill, Churchill and, and Stalin, Stalin, who were masters yeah. at their craft. Yeah. So anyway, we came back about three or four more nights and we played for Truman and his, uh, and his colleagues, the generals and whatever. And then Truman actually, one night he played the Missouri Waltz, he sat down at the piano. Because he was a good pianist, was he not? Yes, he yeah. was, and yeah. he, he told us he practiced. He got up at 5 o'clock every morning and practiced the piano, and just he just loved music. You could see. Mm. And he, he, he played, and then once when he, we, he was playing, and Gene and I were leaning over, turning pages for him, he said to us, kind of sotto voce, he said, you know, I wonder how much better off the country would have been if I had become a concert pianist. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> of course, we couldn't say a thing. No, of course not. <laughs> well, first of all, we didn't know at that time what he would become. Yeah, of course. You know? So anyway, that was the, that was the story we played just uh, every uh, almost yeah three or four times more for him. And, Amazing. And then we went home. <laughs> that was it. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. sharing that story. Yeah, it's it's a I, nice I'd history. I'd read it, but I hadn't heard yeah, it from the horse's mouth. Yeah, it's a, it's mouth, a nice so. history story. <laughs>